This lesson is not what I was planning to preach, and you'll have to excuse me, but this is a lesson I think is so important for us. If you have a Bible nearby, would you turn it to the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles? 2 Chronicles, I'm going to read from chapter 7, verses 1 through 15. I believe this is the first lesson I have preached in at least 20 years that is totally unprepared, literally off the cuff. But I think it's important that I preach it, especially today, in light of what this area has gone through. We talk about the ice storm, the power outages. Some sitting here still do not have their power restored. And we pray that soon everybody will have it back. And thank God for all the utility workers and also city workers who've been clearing the streets. And some of them, uh, especially late Wednesday night and into Thursday and Thursday night and following nights, have, especially the first few nights, were in very hazardous uh, conditions, weather conditions, to do that type of work. Okay, Second Chronicles chapter 7, starting at verse 1. This is all connected with the dedication of the temple of God, which Solomon uh, and all those in Israel who assisted put together in seven years. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. I just try to picture that. The, the glory of God is so strong in the temple. I don't know if it was a sense of brightness, brilliance, just a force of it, but even the priests who were supposed to could not get in it. Fascinating. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And they realized it was only by God's mercy that Israel at this point was at its strongest, militarily speaking, strategically speaking, that the temple was allowed to be built in the first place. Because although at this point Israel was probably the strongest nation at this point on planet Earth, they still had many, many enemies who in the future would destroy much of what had been built here. We go on. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. You have to know God was impressed. This, I don't know if there was ever a sacrifice involving this many animals previously. But this certainly was impressive to God. And the priest attended to their services. The Levites also with instruments of the music of the Lord, which King David had made to praise the Lord, saying, For his mercy endures forever. Whenever David offered praise by their ministry, the priest sounded trumpets opposite them, while all Israel stood. Furthermore, Solomon consecrated the middle of the court that was in front of the house of the Lord. And there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of peace offerings, because the bronze altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat. At that time, Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him, a great, very great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt. On the eighth day, they held a sacred assembly, for they observed the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. On the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people away to their tents, joyful and glad of heart, for the good the Lord had done for David, for Solomon, and for his people Israel. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's house, and Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord in his own house. At this point, the nation of Israel gets 
A second start. A great start. God is with them. God is blessing them. But I want you to remember, it didn't last for long. And you'll see God indicating that. Verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And then God makes a prediction, something he's going to do. And he'll only do it because of disobedience. Many of these Jews who so believed in God, so willingly offered sacrifices to God on this day a few years later, would be worshiping other gods. Well, God says, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, this would be Israel's land, or send pestilence among my people, because God knew the direction they would go in, then God makes this plea, and you've heard this read numerous times, most of you, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and here heal their land. Now, that is, if this occurs, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. A few days ago, I was walking through our city, and the first day, Thursday morning, I was impressed, I guess if you could say it that way, by just how much damage had been done right around this part, including in front of our own church building. And fortunately, somebody came very early Thursday morning before daylight and started actually because... Some of the larger limbs had fallen across Phillips Avenue here, blocked the street, more police cars. Some had blocked Church Street the night before, well, or earlier that evening, much earlier, uh, actually Wednesday night. And So some of them are doing the same here, but some people came by, cut up the main parts of the wood and carted them off, I guess for firewood, maybe future. But anyway, um, the next day I walked through more of Milan and just saw how many Fences had been knocked over by huge limbs and and saw some damage to garages and porches. I didn't see any cars that were crushed, but I only covered maybe 5% of the city in an hour's walk and uh, and the devastation. But it reminded me of something God has promised to every nation that turns their back on God. Destruction Natural calamity, disease, pestilence. Many unfortunate happenings are promised by God to those nations that will occur in an effort to get those nations to wake up, at least have some semblance of returning to God. It's happened to many nations throughout time. It happened to Israel. It's happening in our nation. I don't think we've seen that just the tip of the iceberg as far as what God is going to have to bring on our nation in an effort to wake it up. By the way, there was a time where I still referred to the United States as a great nation. I have not said that in several years. Because I do not believe we are a great nation. I believe we are a nation that still has some great people in it, including you. But a great nation, because for the most part, our nation is drifting farther and farther away from God, literally by the moment. Punishment's coming. The end ultimately will be here. But God in his mercy may send grievous punishments. In storms, hurricanes, twisters, earthquakes, of which we have never seen the like in the United States. Now listen, if you believe God's word, and this is just one of many passages to talk about God's punishment. Promise punishment to nations that turn away. Now, 
Worse will come if the Bible is right, and I believe it is. But here's what I want my message to you. You and I, even as a church family, we can't change our nation. But we can certainly, as, as individual Christians and as a church, stand for what's right, courageously stand up for what's right, and make it known as much as we can what's right. And that's important. But there's one other important thing. When, I don't say if, unless our nation changes, I don't see that happening. But when the worst things happen that will change our lives overnight. A lot worse than this ice storm. Much worse. Whether it be through enemies, look up EMP, electromagnetic um, pulse, by the way, which we're constantly threatened by, not only by our sun, but other hostile nations, and natural catastrophes. When it happens, the church will have to be closer together for our faith to survive than we are now. Much closer. Some suggestions were made in our Bible class this morning. Great suggestions, great thoughts, some of them tragic thoughts. And based on, and Alex was talking about something Corey had said. And then I made the observation. I said, you know, the storm and the outages affected most, if not all of us. How many of us thought to call Lupe Valdez to say, are you all right? I only thought about it Friday morning. Well over 24 hours after she lost power. She's all right. Her family has seen to that. But we should have tried. How close are we as a church family? To our immediate families, yes. But I'll tell you what, the day will come, and I'm not a prophet, I'm just saying what God has promised to those nations that turn from Him. The day will come where everything will change. And not just for three or four days or week or month. Maybe for the duration, in our nation at least. If we're not close, all of us close, loving and considerate and reaching out and forgiving and helpful and serving, then you won't really have a church family to really depend on. You have to look to your own immediate family. And although that will help, it won't be enough, not nearly enough as what God intended for the church family to be. Remember one thing. The persecution that occurred in the first century, brought initially by Jews and eventually by the Romans, and persisted past the first century, most of the churches that were able to survive did so as church families. We have a lot of growing to do. I know we know how we should be. But I, when I was thinking Friday and finally called Lupe, I thought, what was I thinking of? It's only natural to think of Brenda. It's only natural to think of our immediate families. It's only natural for me to think of my sister and Adrian. Though I'll tell you what, I didn't really think of her until late Thursday night. So, Jesus prayed before his death that all of his followers, all the believers, be one. The Apostle Paul, read 1 Corinthians First chapter 1, pleaded with the church to be one. And Paul, to the church in Ephesus and Philippi and Galatia, begged churches to come together and be one. 
and put aside anything that would disturb, that would interfere with that disunity. And may God help us to do the same. And I pray the next time something very, now I'm going to call it minor. You may not call it minor, especially if you don't have your power back. Relatively speaking, compared to what could and probably will come, if we can't reach out to one another as a church family in these cases, we're going to have a hard, hard time with things that in his word God says will come. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, I apologize that this lesson was not planned. The only thought of this lesson came to mind when I realized how late I was reaching out to one of our longtime members, Lupe Valdez. And I felt so pathetic and selfish. And I was hoping when I did call her, she would say, others have called before you. And no one had. And I thought, if others like me are so focused on our own immediate family that we put the church family on the shelf, okay, maybe with this instance it was not that big of a deal. But based on what you told Solomon, during the greatest day of dedication to you, maybe the world has ever seen, yet you saw what was coming. And you knew what you'd have to bring upon Israel. A nation that eventually splintered. A nation in which both sides were taken into captivity and only a very few from the southern kingdom ever returned to their homeland. So whatever you have to wake this nation up will affect every single one of us. And help us to grow as a family certainly to grow in spreading the gospel, to enlarge not so much our family as your kingdom. And help us to reach out more to one another, to be more concerned, and to, uh, to be able to stand and would stand and endure very hard times that may be coming in the next few years. May we be the church family that Jesus intended and prayed for, that Paul urged so many churches in the New Testament that we read. Forgive us. Forgive me. Help us. Thank you for your mercy and your kindness and your forgiveness. And thank you for your word, the truth we have. And thank you for Jesus Christ most of all, that still today, although he hung on that cross nearly 2,000 years ago, he still, with his arms outspread, inviting, welcoming to come to him all those who labor and are heavy laden, and the heaviest burden is sin. There may be some this morning who are burdened by sin because they have never come to obey the gospel of Jesus, have never put all their faith in him, Sufficient that they will repent of their sins and confess him freely and openly and be baptized. We pray they might if they're here this morning. But those, Father, who need your help, who need you to help them to be stronger or to help them to deal with weakness or adversity in their own lives, that they would let their church family know. Forgive us for feeling embarrassed about letting family know when we're struggling. And thank you again for listening. And thank you for loving us despite our failings. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. If anyone needs to respond to the invitation to come to Jesus and obey the gospel, if you need our prayers, you can feel free to come have a seat up front here as we now stand and sing the song.